Pokemon has grown to become the world's highest grossing media franchise with over 100 billion in sales. Although the franchise started off on the Game Boy in 1996, by the year 2000, Pikachu and friends were plastered on everything from cards to toys to lunchboxes to Happy Meals to pasta. Yes, Pokemon pasta. Over two thirds of Pokemon's revenues have come from merchandising, and this was driven in large part by the perfect advertisement, the children's television show. In the late 90s, Pokemon seemed like an overnight success, but in reality, this success didn't really come overnight. It was the culmination of decades of evolution in children's programming. Let's talk about Saturday morning cartoons. Before we go deeper, if you're new here, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Now, you might be wondering why a channel that has only posted video game challenges is doing a deep dive into the history of cartoons. But some of you may have realized by now that the tissue connecting all of the games featured on my channel is that they all had popular Saturday morning cartoons in the late 90s and early 2000s, when I grew up. I played several classic Mega Man games growing up, but I first learned about the Battle Network series through the cartoon on Kids WB, after which I found out about and started playing the games on Game Boy Advance. Today, we're going to talk about how cartoons were a gateway to monetization of other products for many media franchises. If we zoom out and look at the highest grossing media franchises of all time, you can find plenty of other big names that took up a slot on Saturday mornings. Pokemon, Spider-Man, Transformers, Looney Tunes, Batman, Dragon Ball Z, and that's not even touching on other beloved franchises like Scooby-Doo, He-Man, and Tom and Jerry. First of all, what is a Saturday morning cartoon? Well, the first cartoon character was created in 1919, Felix the Cat, and was followed by some of our favorites to this day, including Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny, and Tom and Jerry. By the 1950s, Televisions became much more common across U.S. households, but most programming was focused on the news, dramas, and comedies. Children's programming remained a relatively untapped market opportunity, given that prior to the advent of the television, the best way to get in front of kids was through magazines and comic books. A TV was already in the home, and children were used to waking up early every day because of school, so the 1950s introduced Saturday morning cartoons. In order to understand the evolution of children's programming, we need to do some very quick background on television programming in general. In the 1950s, there were really four major television networks, CBS, ABC, NBC, and Dumont. This was called network television. Everyone in an area would be able to watch all of the channels that broadcast in that area for free, assuming that they had a TV and the appropriate antennas. These TV networks made money selling advertisements during commercial breaks. Cable, on the other hand, was a subscription service where data was sent directly to your television by, you know, a cable. But because it was a subscription service, cable typically had fewer viewers and advertising revenue was lower. For a standard network television channel, you could think about their programming in blocks that targeted certain demographics. For example, on a weekday from 9am to 3pm, Shows like soap operas would air and average 4 million viewers and typically be targeted at housewives. Advertisers would pay around $200 per minute of advertising. In the evenings, viewership averaged around 30 million people as entire families would gather to watch TV and advertisers would pay up to $2,000 in the 50s for a single minute of commercials. It was very difficult for advertisers to be targeted with their demographics, since the viewership demographic at the time was just anyone who had a TV in the area. But that started to change with Saturday morning cartoons, as advertisers knew that their commercials would be watched by children, and viewership could average 20 million people. As a result, advertisers paid between $1,000 and $2,000 per minute of advertising, but this number could be as high as $3,000 in the 50s, depending on the time slot. The scarcity of opportunities to advertise to children made Saturday mornings very lucrative to advertisers, and so they were willing to pay more per minute than they would for even the primetime evening slots. 
One of the first and most influential Saturday morning cartoons was The Woody Woodpecker Show, which aired on ABC from 1957 to 1966. The show had 200 episodes and was syndicated around the world long after its initial runtime. So people of all ages, myself included, grew up watching the show. It made some money through short films and theme park licensing, but the TV show was the real revenue generator for the show. This was driven by commercial breaks selling cereal, juices, toys, games, and snacks. Saturday morning cartoons weaponized impressionable kids against weary parents, tired after a long week at work. Even though kids themselves didn't have money, they definitely had the ability to annoy their parents into giving in, and that was enough for brands like Sunny Delight and Frosted Flakes. This became immensely profitable for companies, since a typical episode would cost around $6,000 to produce, but make up to $10,000 in advertising revenue per slot. Making an episode was a one-time fixed cost, but it could be aired several times on the same network after that, not to mention syndicated onto other networks locally and around the world. In the 1960s, things started changing when Superman, the first superhero cartoon, aired in 1966. It was a roaring success, and just like how Iron Man's success kicked off the modern superhero genre, Superman was followed by a whole slew of superhero cartoons like Spider-Man and Fantastic Four, both of which came out in 1967. Unlike Woody Woodpecker, which made most of its money from the advertising that sat between the show's contents, superhero cartoons uncovered a whole new market. Toys explicitly based on cartoon characters, whether it be Superman, Spidey, or the baddies that they beat up. Superhero cartoons precipitated a huge rise in the popularity of toys, and this led to the creation of action figures, with DC and Marvel licensing their properties to toy manufacturers like Mattel and Hasbro. This is when the entire industry started to introduce the concept of cross-selling, the sales technique of selling another product related to something that a prospective customer is already into. If you liked the Spider-Man TV show, you'd probably like a Spider-Man action figure, or a Spider-Man t-shirt, or a Spider-Man comic. This was also around the time that we saw the first Japanese import of a TV show, the hugely popular and influential Astro Boy, which first aired in 1963 in both Japan and the US. Each episode cost about $22,500 to produce at the time, which was very cheap compared to a show like The Jetsons, for example, which could cost over $50,000 per episode according to some reports. This is, in part, due to the lower cost of labor in Japan at the time. A Japanese animator in 1963 could make 50 to 60 yen per hour, or between 14 and 17 cents, versus an animator at a studio like Disney who could make $4 per hour. There actually continues to be a cost of labor difference today, with the Japanese anime industry being notoriously underpaid relative to their US counterparts, but that's a conversation for a different video. By the 1970s, children's programming began to grow significantly, but Saturday morning cartoons were still on top of the food chain. The newest and most popular shows would be aired on the three major networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, but would also start to be syndicated to local TV networks. At this point, there were enough shows that had already aired on network television that could now be aired on local channels, especially as kids came home from school, which led to the rise of after-school programming. But the 1970s was defined by the decline of superhero shows and the rise of comedy cartoons, with Bugs Bunny and Scooby-Doo being regularly at the top of the ratings. While superhero shows were still mildly successful, there were a number of factors that led to a decline in popularity. First and foremost, there was a sense of fatigue due to repetitiveness and saturation, similar to the Marvel fatigue that many are experiencing nowadays. Most stories targeted to children were extremely simple stories of good versus evil, with superheroes being powerful figures who upheld law and order. In the 70s though, there was a lot of social and political unrest, including the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, and the Feminist Movement, which led to a cultural shift away from all-powerful figures and towards more relatable and flawed characters like Shaggy and Fred Flintstone. These shows were also very low cost to produce, since Hanna-Barbera had a very distinct style that allowed it to produce shows at a very low budget. 
This one studio alone was able to pump out tons of content with over 60 separate series being released in the 1970s, including shows like Scooby-Doo, Josie and the Pussycats, The Jetsons, Speed Buggy, Hong Kong Fooey, Tom and Jerry, and Jabberjaw. Even the one successful superhero show during this decade, Super Friends, was produced by Hanna-Barbera. This meant that the studio had a plethora of characters to monetize and sell on merchandise, and they weren't just slapping things on t-shirts. One of the most successful licensed items of all time was the Flintstones multivitamin, which even I grew up having in the 90s. This contributed to Hanna-Barbera becoming the fourth richest cartoonist group by some estimates. However, even though Hanna-Barbera had quantity, Warner Brothers was the studio with top ratings year in and year out with its Looney Tunes shows. The Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour was a show that regularly reused older content, allowing it to have very low production costs. According to an LA Times article, the show would reap 10 million of revenues annually, with very strong profit margins because the show's clips came from its vault of over 750 short films from prior decades. During this era, Bugs Bunny was absolutely everywhere. Although the popularity of characters like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck has waned somewhat in recent decades, Looney Tunes was an absolute behemoth, as the franchise has earned nearly 18 billion in revenues to date, with roughly 17 billion coming from merchandise sales. On top of comedy and superhero cartoons, the 1970s saw the rise of one more major genre, sci-fi. Science fiction cartoons in the 1970s were defined by a love for space travel and mirrored much of the successful content in live action TV at the time. The US was in the midst of the space race, and the Apollo 11 had just landed on the moon in 1969, which was a monumental event that was seen live by approximately 600 million people around the world. Beyond that, technology was advancing so quickly that there was a great deal of curiosity about what the future held in store. Shows like the original live-action Star Trek in 1966 and Battlestar Galactica in 1978 were hugely popular for science fiction, and this made its way down to children's programming, led by Star Trek the Animated Series. This was a direct sequel to the original show, with the same characters and voice actors. There was, however, a huge difference in cost. The live-action show cost about $200,000 per episode to produce, versus about $75,000 for the animated series. Star Trek The Animated Series was hugely influential when it came to Star Trek merchandise, with the phaser gun in particular being one of the most popular children's toys at the time, with millions of units sold. Next came the 1980s, which many consider the peak, or golden age, of children's programming. There were an estimated 100 to 120 different shows on air during this decade. This decade also saw the rise of after school programming, as there were just too many shows to fit in one morning, and those slots were getting extremely competitive. Some shows were produced specifically to be aired after school, such as Transformers, He Man and the Masters of the Universe, and Thundercats. But the line was very blurry, as most shows would be shown both after school and on Saturday mornings to maximize reach. Most of these cartoons were heavily toy-based, with action figures and merchandise being major drivers of sales for these franchises. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, for example, first aired in 1987, and if you look at the estimated revenue breakdown for the Ninja Turtles, about 60-70% to 70 of its revenues came from toys and merchandise, with only a quarter coming from TV shows and movies. Hasbro in the 1960s had a line of military action figures that came out around the same time as the superhero action figures, but it was only in 1983 that it produced G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, which skyrocketed action figure sales. In 1985, Hasbro sold $1.2 billion in toys and merchandise, versus just $50 million the year prior to the show's release. Hasbro also created Transformers, alongside Japanese toy company Takaratomi. After releasing the toys in 1984, Hasbro hired writers from Marvel to help produce a storyline and characters, which is the origin of the ongoing battle between Optimus Prime and Megatron. Another company doing the same thing at the time was Mattel, which created He-Man. The toy line was established in 1982, followed shortly by the release of the show in 1983. By this point, the entire entertainment industry was centered around licensing and merchandising. George Lucas famously traded his director's fee for his work on the original Star Wars movie for the merchandising rights for the franchise, which made Lucas billions from licensing deals. 
As a result, he was a major beneficiary from the two Star Wars animated shows from the decade. Star Wars Droids, which was a prequel to A New Hope centered around R2-D2 and C-3PO, and Star Wars Ewoks, which focused on Ewoks on Andor. As you can imagine, that was a strategic move, given that Ewoks and droids are extremely cute and marketable, and very easy to sell as toys. But the 1980s also saw the entry of a new type of merchandise, video games. About 5-10% to of the Ninja Turtles revenues came from video games, and this was a new phenomenon in the 80s as video games started to proliferate both in arcades and at home. One of the most successful shows of the decade was The Smurfs, which made an estimated $500 million in TV revenue during its original run. That's really impressive when you consider that it cost an estimated $77 million to produce all 256 episodes of the show. On top of that though, the show also spawned successful video games which were released on multiple Atari systems, with the first game selling over a million copies and receiving strong critical acclaim. As video games became more popular, the pipeline from cartoon to video game began to flow the other way. The first video game to inspire children's cartoons was Pac-Man. The game was released in 1980 with a two season TV show that released in 1982. If the 1980s were the peak of programming, the 1990s were the peak of commercialization. There was so much money being generated that it became an arms race of content. The cost of producing content grew significantly over the years, with shows like Scooby-Doo in the 60s costing $60,000 to produce each episode versus Transformers in the 80s costing $300,000 to produce to Batman in the 90s costing $1 million to produce per episode. The increased competition led to a push for higher animation quality and better voice actors to draw in viewers. However, advertising revenue for Saturday morning cartoons had begun to decline in the 1980s due to the rise of cable TV. Cable TV went from being in about 10% of households in the 60s to nearly 80% in the 90s, and that meant that cable channels like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network offered advertisers even more spots to place their ads in front of children. Cartoons were now shown on a lot of channels, and advertisers had a lot of options to choose from. As such, it was even more important for children's programming to have other income streams. Even behemoths like Disney were entering the mix, with both original content and movie tie-ins. Its first big cartoon during this era was DuckTales, and man, I love the DuckTales theme song. Disney also released a TV series in 1992 as a sequel to The Little Mermaid, which had its theatrical release in 1989. This was a way for Disney to extend the impact and monetization potential of an expensive feature film without having to produce a true sequel, which, you know, they still did, but there are already plenty of videos out there about Disney and their direct-to-video era. As you can tell, the animation quality for the TV show on the right was significantly worse than that of the feature film, and so as a result, it was a very lucrative return on investment because it was a low-cost way to extend the impact of the feature film. Since their budget for the original movie was $40 million and ran 83 minutes long, or about $482,000 per minute of animation, versus the TV series costing $500,000 to produce per episode, with each episode lasting 22 minutes, or about $22,000 per minute of animation. It was a very low-cost way of getting people to continue buying flounder dolls, and it worked. Going back to some of the other major trends of the 90s, shows seem to fall pretty neatly into one of four categories. Number one is action, including Ninja Turtles, X-Men, and the beloved Batman animated series. This continued the extremely lucrative action figure sales machine. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have the highest peak Nielsen ratings in the entire decade, with a rating of 11.7 in 1990. There was also a deliberate shift towards more programming for girls, including action shows like Powerpuff Girls and Totally Spies. Number 2. Comedy, including shows like Animaniacs, Rugrats, Tiny Toon Adventures, and DuckTales, which were meant to be lighthearted and cute. Rugrats in particular was a behemoth, leading the Nielsen ratings in both 1991 and 1992 despite being on cable television. Later in the decade, Sabrina the Teenage Witch led in 1997. Number 3 was educational cartoons, which really began to compete with mainstream content, with shows such as Arthur, The Magic School Bus, Cyber Chase, and Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, 
all of which were produced by and aired on PBS. Prior to the 90s, there were definitely cartoons that had positive messages for children, such as Schoolhouse Rock, which aired on ABC beginning in 1973. But parents were concerned with the impact of children's programming from the very beginning. There were groups like Action for Children's Television, which was formed in 1968 to combat violent programming and over-commercialization of children. But in 1967, the Carnegie, yes, that Carnegie, Commission for Educational Television published a report arguing that a public, non-profit television network would be much better for children, focusing on ethics and skill building rather than on action and advertising. This led to the creation of the Public Broadcasting Service, or PBS, in 1969, which was funded largely by government grants and private donations. They showed few to no advertisements compared to other channels, but had very limited budget. So in the 70s and 80s, PBS produced live action shows like Sesame Street, The Electric Company, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and The Joy of Painting. PBS received the bulk of its funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a nonprofit organization that was exclusively funded through the federal annual budget process. As you can see here, the CPB budget had grown significantly over time, with a large portion of this going to animated content, which was further supplemented by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. The fourth and final category that was extremely popular in the 90s was anime. While anime had been imported since Astro Boy in 1963, one of the most popular anime in the US in the 80s was Robotech, which aired in 1985. It was relatively popular, especially because it was aired on syndication, meaning that it wasn't limited to a single channel. However, everything changed with the introduction of Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z in 1995 and 1996 respectively, both on Cartoon Network's Toonami. They are both adaptations of manga, but were extremely popular and are both pretty high on the list of highest grossing media franchises. Dragon Ball is number 16, with an estimated revenue of $27 billion, while Sailor Moon is number 40, with an estimated revenue of just over $14 billion. Dragon Ball earned about $7.7 .7 billion from merchandising, or over 44% of its sales, while over 90% of Sailor Moon's revenue has come from merchandise. This is also similar to other franchises like Mobile Suit Gundam, where over 97% of revenues come from merchandise sales. One of the advantages of importing shows from Japan was that they were ready-made and just needed to be redubbed, which removed substantial production costs involved in animating a show. The US network would pay a licensing fee to the Japanese studio, dub it, and it would be a win-win for everyone involved given the immense competition for content. Even though DBZ, for example, was extremely popular in its own right, it only ever peaked as the number two most popular television show in any given year. It consistently fell behind the monster that was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which was number one in 1996. But it wasn't just 1996, it was also the number one children's cartoon in 1995, 94, and 93. That's four years in a row. Power Rangers is a pretty creative case study because it was one of the first Japanese imports that really took advantage of merchandising. I loved it growing up and have really fond memories of watching it with my younger siblings. I also really loved the recent movie, but the evolution of the Power Rangers franchise probably deserves its own video. Seiban, the creator of Power Rangers, licensed footage from the Japanese show Super Sentai and filmed a bunch of live action American actors for the non-action scenes. This created a low-cost powerhouse of a TV show. Even though it was a series with a somewhat connected plot, each season was basically rebranded into a new show, and that meant it was easier to sell action figures for each new series, and there was a lot of them. My favorite was Lightspeed Rescue because it had the best theme song. If you disagree, leave a comment and we can talk about it. This process of splicing and dicing was also done with Robotech in the 1980s, which was really a redubbed and re-spliced version of three different anime into an entirely new plot for American audiences. The first eight years of the 1990s saw so much evolution in terms of commercialization, but everything changed on September 8th, 1998. We've come full circle with number one on the list, Pokemon. Pokemon was unlike most other shows at the time, since it was an adaptation of the extremely popular Game Boy games, Pokemon Red and Green in Japan. After it came to the US though, it was revolutionary, 
Most TV shows made money from advertisements, but Pokemon was the pinnacle of a TV show being an advertisement in and of itself. Much of the franchise's early success was the result of maximizing consumer spend due to having products across various price points. The Pokemon show wasn't just cross-selling toys that cost $5 to $10 like Ninja Turtles, it was driving sales of the Game Boy Color that cost $70 and a game cartridge that cost $40. That $70, by the way, counts towards Nintendo's revenues and isn't even included in Pokemon's figures, even though Pokemon was a major driver for Game Boy sales. On top of just having four turtles and a rat to sell action figures of, Pokemon had 151 different monsters when it first came out, along with all of the human characters that people fell in love with, like Ash, Misty, and Brock. On top of that was the trading card game. The card game was originally created in Japan in 1996, but was adapted for the US market in 1999 by Wizards of the Coast, the same company that produced Magic the Gathering. The trading card game remains a major driver of sales and has generated nearly 11 billion of revenue alone, which is higher than the entire Star Trek franchise, including movies, TV, everything. The ability for Pokemon to license out its brand to so many different companies ramp up production, and meet insane demand is one of the many factors that allowed it to capitalize on its early success. Pokemon became the highest grossing licensed entertainment property in the world in 1999, and in 2001 alone, it made $4 billion in merchandise sales. That's more in one year than G.I. Joe made in its entire lifetime. But despite all of the money being spent, Pokemon was not a franchise just for rich kids. It was able to segment its customer base by selling both expensive items, such as the video game and limited edition collector's items, to lower cost items such as toys and trading cards. But those are still discretionary spending items. Pokemon even branded consumer staples such as the pasta we saw earlier. Pikachu and friends were soon on every product under the sun, from lunchboxes to hats to backpacks to school supplies. Different products catered to families with different willingnesses to pay, but almost everyone could participate in the Pokemon craze in some way. Even if someone wasn't able to afford the game or a single toy, the cartoon served to level the playing field in terms of access to pop culture, as the network TV show was free to watch. The Pokemon anime allowed huge audiences in lower socioeconomic classes, both in the US and abroad, to participate in the world of Pokemon, even if they couldn't afford to play the games. And this was an extremely important part of Pokemon's success, given the 2000s dot-com bubble and associated recession. This was in stark contrast to shows like SpongeBob SquarePants and Powerpuff Girls, which were on paid cable TV. Even if cable TV was growing in popularity, it wasn't ubiquitous, and often led to many children feeling left out of the conversation of certain TV shows. One of the most interesting parts of the show is that the main character, Ash, was going on a journey in the same world that you, the player, are when playing the video game. But unlike many other games and adaptations, you weren't just replaying and reliving the exact same story. Every time you play the game, you have the power to choose how you want to advance your journey, including the Pokemon that you catch, the places you visit, and the order you go in. If we look at a franchise like Dragon Ball, which has had pretty good success with its own video games, most of the plot lines are just direct retellings from the manga and anime, with direct scenes and lines from the show, including the original NES and SNES games, which literally just retold certain arcs of the story, and this hasn't changed with the recent release of Kakarot in 2020. The Pokemon TV show was interesting not in spite of the fact that it was different from the game, but because it was different. You could play the game and argue with friends on the playground about what was and wasn't relevant, and you could laugh at Ash's incompetence while you were able to beat Brock on your first try when playing on your own. Pokemon's success was on a whole different stratosphere than that of earlier IPs like He-Man, and it ushered in a wave of similar intellectual properties that were built to merchandise existing products. This included Yu-Gi-Oh!, which was consistently neck and neck with Pokemon and Nielsen ratings for several years in the early 2000s. Yu-Gi-Oh! started off as a manga in 1996, but soon became a formal trading card game in 1999. Similar to Pokemon, there was a major collection aspect, but it also included trading and battling just like Pokemon did. The battling component was much more accessible, since you just needed cards rather than a Game Boy, a cartridge, and a link cable. I personally have a lot of memories of playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in recess and after school, 
One of the interesting components of Yu-Gi-Oh! was that children would often win cards by beating others, which would also serve to even the playing field somewhat across the socioeconomic spectrum and allow more people to participate even if they couldn't afford to buy a lot of cards. For the company, cards were extremely cheap to produce and could be sold in more affordable packs than most kids would be able to convince their parents to buy. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s revenue breakdown is quite different from most of the other shows of this era because it was really quite successful at selling cards, to the tune of 11 billion of revenue, or nearly 70% of its total, followed by merchandise accounting for the bulk of the remainder. Other shows like Beyblade and Metabots were basically created to do the exact same thing as Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh!, produce a toy, video game, or card game, and blasted in popularity through an anime series that could be broadcast throughout the US. The franchise that this channel is most famous for is Mega Man Battle Network, whose anime was aired in the US in 2003, towards the end of this craze. Like Pokemon, it was a show that was effectively meant to be a giant advertisement for the game. There were plenty of non-anime, non-product driven shows in the late 90s and early 2000s as well, including Jackie Chan Adventures, Static Shock, and Rhesus, all of whom consistently had very strong ratings. But this became a time when children's programming was no longer defined by Saturday morning or even just after school programming. The competition for children's attention grew from just one slot to everywhere. The ratings for Saturday morning cartoons had declined significantly by the early 2000s, and there's no one reason for it, but rather a combination of several factors. We've already touched on the rise of cable TV, including Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, and Cartoon Network, and this only continued into the early 2000s. Advertising dollars for Saturday morning cartoons were valuable when it was the only way to reach children, but now, advertisers could access them on multiple channels at many more time slots. Another reason is the rise of the internet and video games. Modern console gaming was also on the rise at this time. Pokemon was an example of a video game leading to the development of a cartoon leading to more sales of the game, but this wasn't necessary once video gaming hit the mainstream. Games like Halo, Counter-Strike, and Final Fantasy were providing immersive gameplay and narrative experiences in and of themselves. Thirdly, Toy and merchandise sales were a major driver of the success of most of the cartoons that we've discussed so far. However, traditional toy sales have fluctuated significantly over the years. Companies like Hasbro and Mattel have gone in and out of financial stress due to factors including declining brick and mortar stores and the rise of digital entertainment such as video games and mobile phones. Regulation was a major factor as well, as advocacy groups continued pushing against advertising towards children, which made creating new content less profitable unless there was another merchandising strategy in place. Another major cause was syndication. There was a wealth of older shows that could be rerun for young children, including shows like Scooby-Doo and Woody Woodpecker. I personally used to watch Woody Woodpecker before school every morning in 2003, and I had absolutely no idea that it was a show from the 50s. Because children couldn't differentiate, there was no need to produce expensive, new content when you could just reuse the old stuff that was already there. Despite the fact that Saturday morning cartoons as many of us knew them growing up are no longer here in the same way, those properties continue to stay relevant. The famous nostalgia pendulum has been in strong effect in the past decade in particular, with many reboots and reimaginings across both TVs and movies. Transformers originally began airing in 1984 and became a super popular movie franchise beginning in 2007, roughly 20 years later. Michael Bay, the director of Transformers, also tried his magic with two Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies in 2014 and 2016, almost 30 years after the original show first aired in 1987. DuckTales was rebooted as a TV show in 2017, almost 30 years after the original aired in 1987. The new show has been really well received and both pays homage to the original while being more relatable to younger kids now. Scooby-Doo is a franchise that has experienced multiple reimaginings since its original release, with the most recent release of the movie Scoob. It was extremely different from the original cartoons, really trying to capitalize on the superhero craze. Some intellectual properties continue to try and stay relevant without a formal quote-unquote reboot. Power Rangers, for example, continues to produce TV shows even to this day. Although ratings have continued to decline, the low cost of production means that Saban is still in pretty good shape, 
although this is definitely a worrisome chart. Pokemon, of course, has remained a powerhouse. The TV show led to the initial burst of interest, but it has continued to be successful on the merit of its video games. The games continue to sell millions of copies despite middling reviews, and there has been a steady stream of spin-offs that leverage the franchise's brand value. The release of Pokemon Go in 2016 was an example of people returning to the franchise due in large part to nostalgia, but Pokemon has never really stepped away from the spotlight. Batman is a major example of a beloved character who many people first became associated with due to the original animated series in 1992. That particular iteration was one of the first gritty, darker adaptations of the character and really established some of the major personalities of the characters we know and love today. Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy was largely influenced by the serious, grounded character work from the animated series. Harley Quinn, who now has a billion movies about her, was actually an original character made for this TV show. The extremely popular Arkham video game series was basically a love letter to the animated series, with several voice actors reprising their roles and with character designs basically being pulled straight out of 1992. Beyond Batman, superhero movies in general have benefited from the ongoing nostalgia pendulum effect. For people like me, the first time I met characters like Spider-Man, Iron Man, and Doctor Strange were on my TV on Saturday mornings, rather than on the big screen. One of the most notable names during the late 90s was Digimon. Most people thought of it as a Pokemon knockoff, given the name and timing, but it actually started off as a Tamagotchi-like handheld for boys, unlike a video game like Pokemon. Despite having pretty good success as a TV show, it was extremely complex as a franchise. Pokemon's goals were simple, catch them all and become a Pokemon master. This was reiterated through catching Pokemon in the game and getting all the cards. Buy all of our things was literally the slogan of the company. Digimon, on the other hand, had no unifying vision, since the show was pretty good, but very different from the toys and games in many ways. The virtual pet toys sold okay, but Digimon wasn't built to compete with Pokemon anyway. It was really meant to be more of a modern version of G.I. Joe or He-Man with an electronic toy instead of an action figure. There's a lot more to say about the impact of Saturday morning cartoons than what I've said here, and I'm sure that there are enormous, monumental franchises that I've barely touched upon. While this is a very high level primer, I'd love to dive deeper into this really interesting and formative time for me, and I'm sure for many of you. I'll be continuing to do video game challenges, but leave a comment below if you'd like to see deeper dives into specific franchises like Mega Man or Digimon. I'd love to hear from you in the comments in terms of what you loved growing up and what you'd like to see next. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.